All right, ladies and gentlemen, what is up? Welcome to the Cal Samrit Podcast. I'm your host, Matty Buller. Alongside me is uh, Crew Brendan Kalajundic, also Crew Barry McDonald. And our special guest today is Jovan Stoyanovsky. Jovan, welcome to the show. We're popping your podcast cherry, I heard. Awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm new to this. Be gentle. <laughs> right on. We will. We'll be very gentle. It'll be a light, caressing podcast. So we've got a lot of questions to get through because you're a very well-liked guy at this gym. And I do have to say, as a member myself, I appreciate the fact that you come here every summer because I know the coaches are short-staffed and and they're taking our fight team a lot of places. And it's really cool as a grown-up to have a guy from Thailand come over to Canada and run some Thai, Thai boxing classes. I think it's pretty legit. So thank you for that. Well, thank you very much, uh, and uh, I like I like to speak of legitimacy. You know, I like to address that during the podcast, and uh, yeah, we're legit, and um, you know, we do our thing. And there's no, you know, Thai people tend to say, you know, not Thai this that. I don't want to name names, <laughs> but certain people, uh, you know, run things as a certain Kool Aid drinking way. But uh, it's all about reality and how things really work, and that's. Uh, that's what we're gonna do. Uh, so, and that's that's what we do do. And I, I want to say to Crew Brandon, my pleasure for for thank you so much for having me. The family, dad, all that mom and dad's, Lonnie's, and uh, just just fit in here perfectly. Thank you so much. Oh man, we we loved having you. Uh, it worked perfectly because Barry was off for two months on his mat leave, and you came in the right time. And uh, you know, you came in every single day and held pads for fighters, new members, every single day uh, with a smile on your face, so thank you. All right, now we've got a list of questions to get through. All so right. you're, just, you're, getting, the, uh, you're yeah. getting the third degree on this podcast. All right, okay. Before we start, I just want to say, fire away. All right, let's All right, it sounds good. So, uh, <laughs> All right, let's see what happens. Yeah. All right, so where did the term, where, where did your nickname come from? How did how'd you get the handle of the Stinger? The Stinger. Uh, stinger was given to me on uh, the King's birthday. King's birthday out of fight. And um, it's, it's just a style of fighting. It's like a move. Uh, I guess you want. it's not televised. You can't see it. But your opponent charges in. You whip, you whip it. It's like a guy. Almost like a hook. But like a crack on the neck. And it won't knock you out. But it'll sting you. It'll give you that quick opening. Create an open. Follow him up. And uh, that's how I got the name. The Stinger. So that Zap. was like your signature move. That was the move, man. Yeah? yeah. That was your people's elbow. That was... Uh, that was the, the the boom you're out of there and set up for the big the big guns. Nice. So, uh, I th- I believe this one's from Coach Bubba. Uh, what are your goals and future plans with bringing the fight team down to Thailand? Well, th- that's actually a great question, and uh, it it you kind of mesh with everybody's goals. Like um, basically, in my town, I, I, in Chiang Rai, Thailand, CY Muay Thai Gym in Chiang Rai, Thailand, based out of Sci Fi MMA. We got a huge facility. Uh, Lonnie Dad was down, and uh, Crew Brendan's coming up, and um, it's a huge proper. The first fight camp in the city, the best gym in the city by far. You can ask any Thai, you can ask any foreigner. I got the best gym because the fact of the, the matter is that my guys win, and uh, gambling is legal in Muay Thai. And at uh, the end of the day, money talks and bullshit walks, and I win, and we bring the money home. So, uh, so it, it, and that that is a big part of the sport, right? Is is people bet on the fights in Thailand, right? Oh hell yeah! I'm yeah. a degenerate sports gambler. My my vice is gambling on football games, but I could totally see how going to Thailand and getting well, into some boxing bets would be pretty interesting. Well. It, Stick a bunch of Asians in a room and then let the gambling ride, and you'll see. You'll see how it rolls. <laughs> you'll see how it rolls. Uh, you know, they, they like a bet. It's, it's fully, you know, full on legal gambling is very restricted in time. There's no casinos, no lottery. Up until a few years ago, you couldn't own a deck of cards. Like really, really illegal. Wow. Except gambling is is fully legal and uh, gambling on fighting only. Can't bet on horses, can't bet on nothing else. But gambling on fighting can be done. So that's and, a big uh, part of the culture. Oh, is it run by the mob? Is there like a mob in Thailand that runs that? Or Absolutely not. It's uh, run by the Lupini Stadium. It's run by the Royal Thai Air Force. Rashtaranan Stadium is, is run and owned by the Royal Thai family. Muay Thai is all very above board. Follows the letter of the law 110%. 
and uh, there's no way around it. Like when I see a guy, we're having this conversation with Kubert yesterday. Guys say all oh, Thai style, the the real, you know, the Thai style is fully full on follows the letter of the law. You're not following the law. They'll, they'll shut your ass down like in two seconds. Okay. No way around it. It's very, very strict, very, very formal, and uh, that's the way it goes. So how do they come up with the odds on the fighters? Like, let's say you're fighting another guy, and you're uh, two to one, and the other guy's uh, six to one. How do, how do they figure out those odds? The, the odds, um, they're figured out. You'll have, you have guys who, bookies, who take bets. Okay. If you go to the PBC, you see a guy with a harness with like eight cell phones on his harness <laughs> taking bets, move. Um, but like, like, for example, we'll walk in the stadium, and, and as you're saying, to get back to the first question, we have a, what am I planning in the future is um, we're throwing the first big show in Chiang Mai, Top Eight International Boxing Stadium. And uh, Crew Brennan's bringing down Team Canada, all the guys from Calisari. And it's going to be Canada versus Thailand. All right, I'm promoting the show. CUI Muay Thai Gym and Sci-Fi MMA. And um, it's going to be a full-on, legit, sanctioned event. And um, then that's uh, it's going to be a huge, huge. No one's ever done it in one shot, in one night. I've got the whole stadium for one night, and it's all ours. Wow. So you're talking like... The Riley Fodens, the Bubba Picards, Princess, like you name it. You, there, our, our big fighters are coming down there? I'm talking a full-on card of eight professional fights. And uh, we got the list as yet. Uh, I believe Kru Goran's in, uh, Kru Brenda's in, and also, uh, sp- also a special fight. We're going to have dads fighting too. Um, full-on sanctioned events, full-on legal, and, uh, and that's how we're going to roll. I got a question real quick. So <clears throat> we fought there. We brought Bruckman there. Tell us a little bit about, you know, Bruckman there. And was there was, were people betting on Bruckman? Was there bets on that? There, there, there's bets. There's bets on every fight. There's bets on every fight. And so uh, what, were, who, what were the odds going have, into, into that one? If you remember, we showed up a bit late, and uh, I didn't even take the odds. I was so nervous. Bruckman was my first big fighter under the side the... CY Muay Thai gym name, and um, and going in there, the odds would have been the odds change for every round. So the first round, oh wow, it's round by round, round by then. round, round by round, the odds change. So but but as you place a bet, that 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 lot. So let's say you take an odd of two to one, the next round is more. There'll be one to one. It, it switches every round. Um, but the the Brockman, his odds weren't that good. Um, he was a tough guy. He fought. And uh, I, I know for a fact, last I checked on him, last I checked, we had a guy down from Canada last year. So, so more than a, than a year before. And the guy had won eight consecutive all by knockout. He's a big Thai kid. And, um, you know, big Thai kid, 84 kilograms, you know, real, real strong, feisty game kid. And uh, he, won, he knocked out eight, eight foreign guys after, after, uh, after the Rhino. <laughs> so, uh, Who's the rhino? The rhino, Bruckman. Uh, mm-hmm. Nick, yeah. my is, that, partner, is that Bruckman? That's what you call him? Uh, my my partner, Nick Nick James Bogord, Nick the Prowler Bogord. Uh, he, he saw Bruckman for the first time. And he goes, he's from the British Channel Islands. And he goes, bloody hell, mate, looks like a rhino. <laughs> Bruckman was just pacing up and down, man, pacing up and down, looking at two nails. So, how much would uh, a guy like Bruckman get paid on that kind of fight? That kind of fight, pretty, just like a lower level thing. Does he uh, get a cut of the bets? Do the fighters get a cut of the bets? Sometimes they're not supposed to, but okay. sometimes because that can then you can start to run into like guys throwing fights, right? Guys throwing fights uh, again. It's all very. I know the guy for a fact was thrown out of Lumpini Stadium. Can never ever fight there again. You gotta, you gotta think. All the guys want to get to Bangkok because Bangkok is the, the NHL. Bangkok okay. is the where the big money is, right? Nobody wants to play, you know, in junior A and get a, just a little bit of money. Everybody wants to play in the NHL, get big paychecks, big money. And, um, yeah, it's been tried before. But, uh, yeah, this guy, he got caught throwing a bet and it never even threw it. Just, just the investigation, whatever, and that's it. Done. Banned. Done. So, it's, um, so a big name guy. What would he get paid if Brockman's wasn't as huge over there? What like a regular like a Thai guy that everybody in Thailand knows? What would that guy get paid for a fight? I guess it would be in bot, wouldn't it? Yeah, and by it's, it goes up to uh, 
big fights go up to millions and millions of baht. Okay. Even even I know a guy thirty years ago used to fight for a million baht every fight, and it just goes all the way down. How 20. much is a million baht Canadian? Anybody For, Google that? Forty grand. Forty grand a fight. Okay. Yeah. That's, What's the most you've ever made? Most I ever made twenty years ago, I made six grand. Canadian. Six grand. Yeah, that's not bad. And that goes over for, here. Yeah. Twenty the years. The pros. <clears throat> I was talking about getting. There's a former UFC fighter around here. I was talking about getting him back in there. Like the most they could pay him was like three thousand dollars. Yeah, three and three. Right? Three and yeah. three, three grand to show, three grand to win. I'm like a former what? UFC. Like so, getting paid. Say that. And like we have entry level pro fighters right now making like four hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah. So you, the most you made, how many years ago was your last fight? 20 years ago. The, the, the big money fights were 20 years ago. Again, it all, it all varies by level because you got to remember, there's, there's so many chances to fight, so many opportunities. And if you fight at Lumpini is one thing, or if you just fight in the sticks is another, and Chiang Mai is more of a state level. So all the, all the paydays vary. Um, betting can be involved. Uh, It'll all be like preset ahead of time. But six thousand dollars twenty years ago in Thailand would have went a long way, right? Like oh, huge money, huge money, right? It was big, big money. You, you could probably buy a house for a million baht. So but like, tell me what you did with the money. <laughs> <laughs> Saved it. Uh, I bought the missus a couple of cats, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the rest, women, booze, and. Typical fighter life, come on. Uh, <laughs> now you're it. here with us. Yeah. Now, now we're here, but hey, man, you're living the dream. That's pretty sweet. Well, there aren't know, a lot of people that could say they did what you did because you're from Ajax. Ajax, is that correct? Or Windsor, Windsor. You're, oh, Ontario, you're from yeah. Windsor. Uh, born and Windsor. So, what? Like, when did you just go? Oh, I'm moving to Thailand because that's a pretty crazy life change. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's a whole story, you know. Um, like. Like I'm, t- I'm an old fella, man. I'm 47 years old, you know. So I ain't a kid. So I'm talking like back, back in the early 90s, like 94, I think was the first time with time. And you be training, you get ready for an in-house, whatever, a little, a, a little fight, and boom, the cops would show up. You know, a certain gyms, camps, I don't want to name names, would phone the cops, and the police would show up, right? So you train six weeks, eight weeks. There was no MMA. Like there was nothing. It was just Muay Thai was brand brand new on the scene, and uh, the only reason I switched I used to do kickboxing, I used to do boxing, but I switched to Muay Thai was just because there was more chance to fight. So you go to the house, so and so called the cops, right? It's shut down. You go, it's canceled, and one day I just got sick of it. And you know, it was pretty wild, ill-behaved young man. And I just said, you know. For, I don't know, I'm going to Thailand, man. That's it. And uh, everybody's like, oh, I'm talking the days there was no internet. You know, like, I just got on the plane and I went. That was it. So let's go back a little farther because one of our, our questions that uh, our, our gym members asked is, uh, what got you started in martial arts? Mm, I was young. My, my, my dad has seven brothers and one sister. It's a big family, right? And his older brother, he was Yugoslav boxing champion, just Western amateur boxing. Wow. And uh, Uncle George. <laughs> and um, anyways, I, I like boxing, so I used to like to fight, and he would show me around. I, I, at first, I started boxing, there, there was nothing else. There was nothing else. And then eventually, you know, found my way into kickboxing. And then eventually when Muay Thai came out, found my way into that. But it's been a battle all the way, the whole way. Because even kickboxing, even boxing, there's just a handful of events. Like our Canadian society is very, you know, very against fighting sports. And even now the MMA is kind of opened up and things. But uh, it's getting there. But uh, but way back in the day, and Ken Hayashi was sports commissioner, shutting down events. And it's, it's always been a huge headache and a huge problem of, of getting fights and actually staying active. So one day I said, I'm going to Thailand. And I used to, I used to commute back and forth, back and forth. I used to go, come, go, come. And then 16 years ago, I went for a haircut, met the missus, and that was it, man. I just stayed there. That was it. Wow. That's so cool. That's such an interesting story, dude. Like, you have no idea how interesting it is that just one day from a haircut 
to meeting a girl to like living in Thailand and, and owning a gym. Like there's so much to unpack there. I can't even begin. And how like, many, uh, how many fights did you have in Thailand? In Thailand, the exact number? I'm not even sure. Uh, yeah. That many, yeah. yeah. Well over 100, 100, yeah. 140, well You can fight, in, which you can fight every in. week, right? Like a couple times a week if you want? My, my all-time record is six fights in uh, six fights in, in four weeks. What? And, and three of them went five rounds. Oh, wow, and, man. Uh, and, and why did I do that? You know, it's hard to buy. I just did that because I needed cash. You know, I needed some okay. money, right? So the electric bell comes in. All right, fight. You know, boom. So you're yeah. a real prize fighter. A like real a prize real fighter. Prize you know, fighter. I just, just, you know, we need rent. Oh, boom. Go and fight. Go and fight. Six fights, four weeks, and I won every single one. And, we, and three of them went five rounds. But it was lucky because the first one was, was a hard one. But then next two weeks, so it just kind of leveled out. But, uh, but yeah, I've been I've been there, done that. So as a guy with only one house fight, the thought of doing six fights in four weeks terrifies me. I don't oh, care. No I don't care how no. easy. Yeah, no shin pads. No like, shin pads. This is real Thai boxing, right? Yeah. What's yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, three of them went five rounds, like five three minute rounds. With you no did the uh, tape, the, the the wrapped hands or the rope on the hands? One time. One, one time. time yeah. How's yeah. that? Yeah. What's that called? I'm uh, sorry. Did you just say you put rope on your hands? And they dip it in honey in and head? gummy bears and broken glass and everything, right? <laughs> no, for that? real. Did you really put rope on your hands for fights? Yeah, they they do it twice a year. It's done all over, but um, they they do it up on the the northern border more often because a little more freestyle, right? But um, I did an udon tiny that's in Isan. And it's right across from Laos. You know what? It's 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 totally different than Muay Thai. It ain't it ain't it's it's, it's different. It's called Muay Kachuk. It's different, but it's the same, really. Um, there's not a lot of combos because everything will knock you out, man. Boom! A sharp jab will bust you open. A sharp cross, like it's more more being like a sniper, like bam, pop. It's just pop, rope. Pop. They just put wrap the ropes around. Yeah, just hands. wrap. I seen a guy one time. No shit. We were up on the border with burn up and made me sway. And he wrapped up his hands, and a one back coin is about the size of a 10 cents, right? So he put the wraps on, he had a roll of one back coins, put it on, oh. and taped it right over, man. And then when it was just a bloodbath, pop, 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 broke up the other guys. It, yeah, nobody cared then. <laughs> that is unbelievable. That's like back in the old days in hockey, they used to put on the foil, right? They would tape their hands and put tin foil on there. But that's even crazier than putting. What's on the worst foil. Uh, worst cut you've ever had, and where was it? How many stitches? Yeah, you got? well, the, the one of our cut. one of our questions is how many stitches you got in your face. All of them. I uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know the number, but because you get extra money, depends where you are. But sometimes you get like twenty bucks more, five hundred baht, and sometimes you get like ten bucks more. So, but you get paid for every stitch. It's like a comp, you know, like workers' comp, because you're gonna be off a bit. Okay. And uh, like there, there's guys, man. There, there, there's guys, and it's not good for you. There, there's guys who just that's why the Thai guys burn out so early because they just fight, fight. It's always for money. It's always for money. a little bit of lot, but they just go, 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 go. Oh, and uh, whoa, cracking some pints. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and drink. um, yeah. So when you get stitched up, means you're gonna be off for for ten days, right? So you get like a better combo, like. You know, you get some extra money. So I, I got, I have more than a hundred. Uh, the worst cut. And you're still a ravishingly handsome man. Uh, I'm devastatingly cr- handsome. Crazy, crazy dude. Devastating. Crazy. Calvin Klein's going to call pretty soon. He wants you for this next underwear ad. Well, let's, let's put Six it Six pack way. in a stitched up face like Terry Sawchuck. You got to love it. Ruggedly handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, going back to uh, before we can go on, because I do have some stuff from the origin story of Joe Van. And that is, uh, they want to know what your first ever fight was your favorite fight and your hardest fight so first what was your first ever fight and how old were you 15 years old okay 15 years old uh, what style of martial art was it kickboxing there was no muay thai it didn't exist uh didn't exist and it was down at like i'm talking the 80s man uh 86 87 i was 15 years old and down at the chin picnic at uh, CNE. 
down to Shin Big Ning, uh, kickboxing, and uh, with like uh, way, way back in the day, it used to swap. Any any good guy can swap boxing, kickboxing. We eventually, once I learned on the Muay Thai, that was my favorite. But um, you can swap back and forth, back and forth. Beautiful. Now, what was your 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 favorite fight that you've ever done? Favorite fight again? I don't care what people say. The favorite fight is where you get the most money for. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's so that was it. when you what, when you got what was that the the six G's six G's man yeah six, so that was you. your favorite fight six and who G's. was it against you remember that was against you very famous guy to this day you turn on the TV you might see him on an ad you see him on billboards famous Thai cat uh, Somrak Somrak Kamsing and. Um, he was uh, he won the first medal t- ever Thai Olympic gold medal in history you know, for the country, and famous famous guy. He a little bit unfair. He was Muay Thai champion already at Rajamun, already a Muay Thai professional champion. Made the switch to amateur boxing, and the rules allowed you know because um, it's a different sport. He fought as an amateur, and he won Olympic gold medal. So yeah, yeah. I guess once you've had some pro fights, going back to amateur is kind of odd. No, no, he, he was Olympic. He was Olympic Muay Thai boxer. champion. He switched to amateur boxing and then competed in the Olympics and won. And won. So uh, he, he was super good. I'll tell you a funny story about that. I go to the way and I was still pretty new. Like, you know, maybe I had like 30 fights under my belt. Still floor, new at right? 30 fights. Still pretty new. So I, I, go, I go to fight this guy. I go to the way in. And uh, you know, the guy's like super famous. Where you can go to any Seven Eleven town and say Somrak, Somos, and they'll know who you're talking about. Like he's a feel like Wayne Gretzky, you know. Like everybody knows the guy. So so I go to the promoter. I go, buddy, you know, like I'm supposed to fight this guy. You know what he said to me? He goes, don't worry, he's no good. <laughs> <laughs> I go, how can he be no good? He won an Olympic gold medal. <laughs> you know, don't worry, he's no good. You know, so I didn't know no good guys win gold medals, man. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a cool, he's a buddy of mine. Uh, maybe when you guys come down, we'll have him down to the fights in Top A, and uh, I might I'll probably have him up for the grand open on October first. Real, real famous guy, nice guy. He likes to drink too, and you know, after the fight, went to his karaoke bar, and uh, when he won the gold, the king gave him twenty million baht. Oh, uh, I the. Oh, 20 million. Near a near million dollars Canadian. A million dollars. A million bucks Canadian. That was his reward 25 years ago. Wow. So he's rich in Thailand. Nah, he blew it all, man. <laughs> Did he? Uh, <laughs> fight, <laughs> fighter's life, eh? Fighter's life, brother. He blew it all, man. So was he also your hardest fight? Who was your hardest fight against? I had plenty. No, nah, there was a guy tougher. I fought this guy and he broke my nose. Uh, he was real, real tough. Yeah, I would have never guessed your nose has been broken. Never? Well, you know, <laughs> it, it suits me. You know. It sure does, buddy. Like you said, it's part of your ruggedly handsome Rugged charm. Hand. You know, the, my, my, my mom says that's why you talk funny. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a deviated septum. Somebody deviated it for you. He fits in well here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've got a lot of fighters at this gym that are up and comers. I couldn't believe it when I actually signed on as a member here because I just live up the street and wandered in because I wanted to get fit. I didn't realize how many killers, especially in the 14 to like 21 year old age group that Crew B has under his belt. So Ow. for these young guys and girls, uh, what would it, what advice would you give them come f- for them to come up and how how can they kind of nurture their career? Well, it all depends what their goal is. And another thing I just want to say, the amount of talent in this place is just ridiculous. It sure is. Ridiculous amount of talent. That's I've never seen Riley Foden sweat. I've never seen him even glisten. No. He's a machine, yeah. He doesn't need to sweat. <laughs> you know, and, and that's... Well, they're, they're, it's, it's impossible all the talent to be concentrated here. That, that goes with the crews and the coaches bringing them up properly. You I'll know, agree you bring with up that. A stable of fighters... And, uh, and you bring them up the right way and the cream rises to the top. Um, and it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean only a moment where there's talent, but the amount of talent, the amount of potential that's, that's been, that's coming up here is huge. 
So what would, what kind of advice would you give them if, let's say, these guys wanted to turn and girls? Pardon me, I'm such a chauvinist pig. Uh, You're a pig, but I totally am. <laughs> Couchon. But what advice would you give them if if they're looking to become a professional fighter? They want to be the prize fighter that Jovan the Stinger is. What advice would you give them? How can they go about doing that? Uh, well, I go about doing it is uh, well. Do they really want to do it? Is the first thing because it's a hard ass road, man. It's a hard ass road. That's the first thing I have a heart to heart with them, and I know Kubi and Ku and Kuber are the bushes have the the heart to heart with them. Dude. It's not an easy road, man. It's a tough. It's a hard. It's a disgusting road. I, would have, I don't have kids, but I. I, I wouldn't want my kids to be a profile. Do okay. something else, man. Do something else. It's a very hard road. So, but if they do want to do it, then all right, then that's a, that's a whole other thing. Why do they want to do it? You know, um, and you know, what, what are we shooting for? Like, if we're going to win and make money, it's it's even harder then. So yeah, it's a uh, it's a hard road, man. It ain't an easy road. It gets harder every time you do it. The, the better you get at it, the the worse and harder it gets, and yep. the lonelier it gets, and the yeah. harder people you fight, and it's everything is to advance you for the next match. So it's like you want to aim for what is the most money on the planet in my division that someone's making. You got to want to take that person out and aim towards them and then reverse engineer it back to where you are now and then move towards it. Yeah, it's funny. I I was talking with Cody because he's got his fight coming up and I'm interviewing him on my radio show on Monday. And uh, he said the same thing. He said ever since he's been ranked in the top 10 in a couple of the major, uh, the WBO and the IBF, uh, he said that anytime somebody like brings up a fight or whatever, it's no longer just, oh, you know, I've got this. It's yeah. this guy's a legitimate contender and so are yeah. you now. So, and I think a lot of what fighting comes down to, and it's funny, I heard Kruby say this like my first week in the gym and it never left me, was the mats don't lie, right? Yeah. And it's funny, you can, when you get up there and you're up there against primo competition, you'll really see what you're made of, right? Hell yeah, of course. Um, you know, proof is in the pudding, right? That's what I like to say, you know, it's, uh, if, if you're training with a guy who, who's the top tenor, then, um, you know, you got to have your stuff in order. Otherwise, you know, you show your weaknesses. Um, now, do you have to train with top talent to become top talent? Should you be sparring, like if you're gonna, if you wanna get up into those pro ranks, should you start sparring pros or working out with pros? Like how do you, how do you even make that jump? Well, that, that, that's up to, to, to your teachers, your crew in your corner, okay. and it's a very gradual process. Nobody walks in the gym one day and then they, they pick them for the top 10 the next. I guess you need to take hockey as an example. You, know, you learn junior A, junior B, you build up, you build up, you, your teachers bring you along, and eventually you make the big time, um, hopefully. Just keep making that cut, right? So it's basically just cut. keep winning those fights and keep training hard, right? That's, keep, that's, yeah. all right. Uh, our next question here is uh, going to be asked by Crew Barry because uh, it should be. Oh, same question what's, you want to hear Barry answer the question? for sure. What am I, <laughs> rephrase that? What do I got to roll back that what tape? Advice, what advice you bring up to upcoming fighters? Oh, upcoming fighters? Yeah. Uh, People that want to fight upcoming fighters. Um, Think about it. So I had that, that conversation with, uh, I've had uh, guys that say I want to be pro. Uh, I, I want to fight. It, you you, you want to fight just to have a fight? Or you want to be the best fighter on the planet? If you want to be a pro, you got to want to be the best person on the planet in your division that makes the most money. Because if you're not, people you're going to meet are going to want that. And you have to have that. And it's just sacrifice and understanding that pro, I mean, they're there to hurt you. And they'll do anything it takes to make sure they win. And that means anything. In the ring, outside the ring, whatever they're doing, everything they're doing is dedicated to get a win. And it's look at it like, like, like horse racing. And we're horses and, and they're the trainers. And I mean, you, you, it's 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 not like a, it's beyond a hobby. Like you're professional, you're being paid for this. You have to be totally obsessed every second of the day. If you're looking at something else, the people you're fighting aren't. 
they're just looking at who's going to be in front of them and how do I crush them. So professional, it's 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 a different thing. And uh, every every move you make every day is either going to make you better and put you towards winning your next fight or move you further away from it and give your opponent advantage. So, I mean, you got to train properly. You have to stay in shape. You got to be in the gym. Uh, you have to base everything around the, the fight itself. Now, a follow-up just to what I asked Jovan as well is, uh, so should you as an amateur and you're looking to make that jump, should you be working out and sparring with pros? Like, I, I, for example, you took Riley down uh, and, and Savannah down to wild card and how yeah. valuable is an experience like that yeah we're down there we're holding them um, was holding pads for them in the ring and, and it, a lot of that was just I mean you're in one of the most famous historical gyms in the world he's hitting pads with Crew B in there, that's where, you know, Manny Pacquiao, Miguel Cotto, Mike Tyson, Oscar De La Hoya, Sugar Shane Mosley, uh, GSP's been there, Shogun, every, the, the who's who of there have been in that exact ring where we're training. I got trained there years ago and I, I was lucky enough to, Freddie Roach trained me some pad sessions in there and I got to have that and everything I learned I brought back to the gym and I do it every day with everybody. But the... The pro style is a little bit different than the amateur style. Pros rougher, and I mean, it goes stuff they'll call you for an amateur. No, they let it go in pro. The referee steps back. You got to put somebody down yourself. If you if you if they're in trouble, the referee's there to count to eight if they fall down. It's not like they'll they'll, they'll jump in. And it's it's. I mean, I've been in pro fights where I, I had a guy thumb me in the eye twice and, and kept kicking me in the nuts. And it was up to me to make that like to beat that guy. But I can start, like I came from that era where everything came from. If I get jumped in a street fight, I got to get this guy off of me, right. and no one's going to help me. And I got to figure out how to move more efficiently. What this is, it's a, it's a game of having better movement than another human, and that movement's going to defeat this human, or it's not going to be good enough, and they're going to steal your land and your resources, and their tribe's going to flourish, and you're going to disappear out of, off the face of the earth. Uh, so it's, 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 it's everything you're about, you live and breathe, has to be about that fight. And, and again, it's, it's just pure dedication. And again, there's ways to do it. Like certain things in pro, there's certain techniques, there's certain, I mean, there's, it's a rougher game. Uh, the inside fighting gets rough. I mean, in boxing, even that, like yeah. there's elbows, there's head butts, you step on the guy's foot, you'll, you know, there, there's ways I can kind of take the guy's knee out from certain positions and things in boxing that, you, it just exists, and that's that's a legit part of the fight. Same with MMA. It's just there's a roughness and a physicality to it that enters into the pro scene. That in an amateur, a they'll call you on and disqualify. It's not there, but pro, it's 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 just a kind of a different animal, and uh, you have to totally. kind of groom them up to that. But you got to prepare for that in the gym properly. And there's ways we can do it. And the, you know the, the, the sparring is different. Again, the rounds are different. The rounds are longer. There's more rounds. Uh, there's less rules. Uh, uh, you can't depend on uh, the padding to help you. Again, everything is in a, a small glove, and, and the gloves in pro are meant to hurt you. They're not meant to pad you. Yeah. They're meant for damage. The gloves I bought down there, wild card, I got every year. I go down there usually twice a year for a little. Uh, I was going for a, a month or two at a time and staying with my buddy Frank when he lived down there. And uh, I go to wild card every morning and every afternoon, and I go to the fight store across the street, and I'll try on the Cleto Ray fight gloves, but they're 450 bucks yeah. US, and they're eight ounce gloves, and they were just, I'd put them on, and I was like, man, I wish I would have fight in these are amazing gloves, but I couldn't afford them, and then finally we're down there with B, and I was like, you know what, this is it, I bought them, they're the eight ounce just fight gloves, but the thing is on them, they're, they're only good for 30 rounds, and you have to retire the glove, because it's made for damage, and it, yeah, it has a marking, and every time you do six wow. rounds, you check it off, and it says now you retire the glove because the padding is so da it's made to damage. It's not a pad. It's 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 to keep your fist tight yeah. so you can throw your fist through it's someone's. Basically, skull. meant to protect your fist. Yeah, and we had people are uh, training them just to get used to the the weight of it and the feel of it. When you put on a bigger glove, you can have a, a eight to ten ounce amateur glove. The padding's different than. The, yeah, there's the much more glove. padding the, over the, the knuckles. I can actually yeah. see it when in the Olympics. The, the, they're always yeah. bigger over the knuckles. Now, you got to think you of your hand. In, in, a, in a pro fight, your hand's a weapon. It's not a... a it's, it's not something you used to score. It's a weapon to destroy whatever's in front of you. And that, that glove keeps your fist tight. 
and to do damage. And they're Mexican style gloves, the ones I bought. So we use them on the pads and on the paddles because I'm not banging them up too much on the bag because I. They, they, one of the most expensive things I, I, I'm a minimalist I don't buy anything <laughs> yeah. ever I buy some food and pay my bills but the only thing I bought for me the last couple years was this pair of boxing gloves so I got a pair of winning gloves that cost me 500 bucks I got these Cluedo Rays that cost me 400 bucks so I got like the two best kind of pairs of gloves the winnings are more for I would say a defensive fighter there's more padding on them and the, the, the Cleto Rays are more of a, an aggressive fighter that wants to damage. So depending on your style, but you can't depend on the glove to shell up. You have to shell, and I attack the, the, when I teach it in class, use your shell to attack their punches with your forearms and your elbows. I can't hold my, it would be like, I say, put a hand pad on the side of your head, now let me throw a left hook into the side of your head. It's, it's going Still right through Still gonna hurt. Yeah, you have to absorb it, and your block has to be a strike into their strike. So. It, it, it's a bit rougher. Uh, there's a certain thing. I turned pro. I had my first profile. I think I was 21 or 22. But I, I grew up fighting from... I had my first uh, like contact fight when I was five. And then I switched to boxing when I was 12. And it was full contact uh, ever since. And boxing and judo and, and jiu-jitsu and everything else we did. But when we got into the, the pro, it was four-ounce MMA gloves. But I was kind of geared towards that. And then growing up, if you heard me on the Brockman podcast, you used to ask me about... Uh, I guess I got in a lot of street fights when I was younger, when I was a teenager and in my early 20s. So not I, you, Barry. It was a, no. No, no, I know, it was never my fault. I'm a nice guy, right? But <laughs> I'm just, really quiet. But, you're out there solving problems. <laughs> it's, it's, I, 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 I had you, I, you know, but I mean, it was... Uh, the thing is, it was, it was a style that we developed that translated for uh, personal it's, protection and, and vale tudo, no holds barred fighting. So when we went to the ring, it was... Having the gloves on was a little bit of a bonus. I'm not gonna, you know, bang my hands up as much. But now, if if you're if you're breeding people coming from uh, a, a lot of the times with the bigger padded gloves in the head gears, and then when you strip that away, it's it's a different sport right now. And uh, totally. we never had that luxury as much when we were growing up. So we were kind of more geared. It was just. Everything was pretty much pro fighting back then. It was pretty much just okay. a fist fight. And if I wasn't pro fighting, I was doing security on the weekends. I was choking out some juice head that was trying to stab me, or I was, you know, yeah. w- walking home with my buddies and somebody trying to jump me, and we're getting into it. But it was you have to hit somebody with your fist. You're not I, hitting them with a glove. You and I had vastly different experiences. I worked my my football coach when I played at Laurier got me a job as the doorman at this club that would get like fifteen hundred people a night. And my coach, or my coach was like, hey, you're pretty. You'll work the front door because everybody at this gym knows me, knows I'm actually pretty much too nice to punch anybody in the face unless I'm seriously in distress. So I would just use that to, if you had too many guys in your group, everybody had to give me 20 bucks to get in the bar. If you were all girls, you, you're in. But that's how I pretty much put myself through school. I, if I ever had to get into a fight, man, I was just the king of like jumping on a guy's back and clawing out his yeah, eyes. I always, like I always a, looked a at it like a, like, a, like a fist fight to me is a science experiment. And I'm like, we're in the lab all day in the gym and I'm training. And if I get into a fight or a judo match or a boxing match, it doesn't, there's no separation to me. It's just whatever the, the format or the rules is or isn't, it's just I got to figure out the movement to beat this guy and be totally emotionalist while I'm doing it. I can't just be... Uh, Anger just steals your energy. Uh, being scared steals your energy. So it's just as, as casual as we're talking. You can get up and have a fist fight and do the right thing. It's a, it's a chess match. You just got to realize the, the the danger that's involved. But and, that and, takes that yeah. takes a while to get to that level, does it not? Of psychology, yeah. because I'll that, tell well, you, man, yeah, yeah. I, I'm still even when I spar now. I've been yeah. at this gym over two years, and I still feel like it's chaos in the ring. It I is. It is not, that's the thing. It's during actually tonight in yeah. in in the. Uh, in, in, in the, the kids' class that I was teaching in Port, we did, a, we did about an hour of them sitting in samurai position, staring into each other's eyes until someone moved first, just to get them controlling of their mind where they're aware of their body. That if my hand's moving, I'm aware. My hand just moved. I know I'm not supposed to move. And it's, no, it's being aware that when you're in a fight, and especially if you're in a, uh, a street fight or a high-level fight, you get that adrenaline dump, you get that fear, you get that... It, Going into a uh, you know a prize fight, you gotta also have that be a bit of a showman and, and not mind the attention because a lot of the times everyone's staring at you in your underwear and there's someone across the ring trying to kill you. You don't realize till you're in there. You're like, shit, maybe th- th- this was different than, than what you thought it would be. But we've done it so many times and we've been there. It's just it's a natural thing and it's about you know I'm trying to checkmate this guy. I'm trying to beat him in this chess match. And if I'm angry or if I'm you know thinking of something else, my mind's somewhere else. 
that's taking me away from what's right in front of me. You got to really be in the moment. And this goes back to like true Muay Thai where it's like, it relates to a lot of like the Buddhism and the mindfulness and staying in the moment and getting on top of your thoughts and not falling and getting lost in a thought. You're just an open, aware receptor of what's coming at you and you're reacting to it and doing the proper thing here. But you take that from the ring and you apply that to life everywhere and you're compassionate, you're loving, you're this and that and above all else, you can kick somebody's ass and keep your family safe if you have to, you know? But that's also my theory in martial arts. And then jovan has got that. He's been in there. He's seen that. And you'll see the higher level guys you meet, they're really laid back and you know yeah. pretty cool. But they can they can turn it on when they need to, and they don't need to have that big, you know, chest bump in an image, I'm gonna yell and swear. It's just it's anger. I call it uh I was really, really aggressive when I fought, but it wasn't an angry. It was, it was, uh, I was trained by my original trainer, Adrian, who trained me to fight like Mike Tyson. And he said, you got three seconds, hit this guy with four shots before he gets out of his corner. Go at him. But it was called controlled aggression. It wasn't an anger. It was knowing when to go fast and hard when you needed to and then turning it on and off as a, it's a weapon. And that's just controlling the pace and the cadence of a, of a match as, need to, uh, uh, as you see fit. Well, what got me coming to this gym actually was uh, I I did uh, for Kortha Combat. I announced I did the ring announcing for the fall brawl, and I hung out with a bunch of the fighters afterwards and stuff like that. And that was when I realized it's not the fighters that are meatheads. No, all the high level dudes there. Like I met this kid from London who who showed up with like I think seventy two hours notice. His name is D- uh, Doug Raby. No, something Raby. From London, good Muay Thai kid, Thomas Rabby, maybe, yeah. Dude, dude was a killer. So I hung out with a few of these guys, and I realized it's not them that are meatheads; it's all their friends in the Affliction T-shirts. And yeah. that's when I said to Crew Kevin Henry uh, at at Core of the Combat, I was like, "I live in Bowmanville. Is there anywhere I can go?" And he gave me two places to go. He was like, "You should go to either Cal Samaret or you should go to Bruckman's Gym." And I just, I, I typed in both on the internet when I got home and saw that Cal Samaret, I literally just live up on Old King Street. I'd come down Roenig Hill, go past Jackie's Critters, and I'm at the gym. And I just happened to, to luck into it. But, you know, to have it where, you know, I'm in Peterborough and I've even got Peterborough people or even this, this rabbi kid be like, yeah, Cal Samaret, that's the gym. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely... Uh, pros to being a member here as well and i i I know we've got to get on because uh we're we're rambling and i know we want to keep this to close to under an hour but this is actually very interesting conversation gentlemen so pardon me i'm gonna let it go a little bit longer here actually i just want to throw in before we switch gears uh crew barry i absolutely one million percent agree with everything the pros and the amateurs two very different worlds two okay. very very different worlds once the shin guards come off the little gloves go on most importantly once it's for cash the whole game changes okay it's not just just fun anymore it's like how many times i fought to pay my electric bill to pay my rent you know you don't fight you don't let like you fight for money a desire hunger um, and yeah, a bit like well, I didn't have I didn't have six fights in four weeks because I thought it was cool. I had six <laughs> fights in four weeks because you had to pay your dough, bills. Man. Yeah, I so needed to. You have a guy fighting for his livelihood. So you have a guy fighting for his livelihood as opposed to somebody that's getting in there because other people want them to fight or they're just following. Oh, yeah. Right? Like you're in there because you need to live. That's the difference. Man. When you're fighting someone that's fighting because they need to eat, that's a different. Uh, Hunger. Different hunger, different Desire. mentality. And, it, and that's the way when you go pro, it has to be like that. You have to look at who's the top person in the world that the real world champion is in their weight class. Now, is that you why the ties are at the top of the food chain? Yeah, they live and breathe. It's their culture, right? It's, 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 again, that's their national sport, though. That's yeah. like well, saying a Canadian's good at hockey, right? But it's yeah, like there's no, no, cool. no separation to what they it, do. It's just they it's are national that. national sport, but also these kids in Thailand are being dropped off at the gym by families that can't afford to raise them. Actually, you know what, Jovan would probably be, I've lived in at Cal Samard a couple times and been on the mats with kids that have been dropped off there, but they're being dropped off there because their parents can't per, like provide a lifestyle for them. Absolutely, so my, my best ever. So these kids are fighting for something different. And they take the name of their that, gym. Yeah, yeah, that we're fighting for. So we meet these kids in the ring they're fighting for something way different than we are. It's deeper. The more layers, they're, they're right into the, the core of that. That's Do the their, kids their fight existence. for money in Thailand? But, well, yeah. uh, this brings me on what the Kubi, what Kubi would say. Best fighter I ever produced 
was that uh, that was uh, the gym Sorpon Chai in Chiang Rai Sorpon Chai gym his, his, whoever his relatives dropped them off at the gym all right his mom and dad were passed on his grandma whoever dropped them off um, the gym took care of him they gave him a place to stay they paid for his books he went to school you know ate at the gym live at the gym and um, I trained him nobody else trained him but me you know, for the time coming up, coming, and he started, you know, slow. Then he just, the way it works, like, nothing. They had nothing. The gym, you don't want, if he said, I don't want to fight, the gym would say, you know, you're out of here. They paid for his school, his room, his food. It's, it's you know, that that was his, his job. That was his way out. And I got him to, uh, finally, they sold his contract, and he got, he got to be a top 10 in Lumpini Stadium. And um, and then he moved to Bangkok, whatever. But Ui, Ui Soborchai brought him up and just brought him from running. Just a poor, poor ass kid and fighting to survive. And he made it. So he's a, he's a, a, how old is this kid now? Now he'd be mid 20s. Is he still fighting? Or? No, no, no. Be retired. they retire early. They do. Well, but if you're fighting from the time you're five years old, I'm, I'm assuming that you can't fight that long in life, right? Yeah, yeah. I've seen the youngest ever I put in was seven years old. Wow. And it's always for money, never for free. Ties don't fight for free. Okay. So there's no real, there's no real amateur in Thai boxing then? No. It's, it's no. all like these kids, they come out, they're pros. The kids come out, the way it works, it's, it's kind of weird. It, they have, the most they'll do is give you a fight with no elbows, right? Like uh, for a okay. young kid, right? Okay. But it's always no shin guards, no headgear, and uh, and it's always for money. It never, you know, the Thai kids they're not interested in looking good, looking cool. They just want you know they want to earn a buck, and and that's it. You know, earn a buck like like hockey here in Canada. They want to look, find a way out. Find something better for themselves. And um, that, that and Thai boxing is the way to go in Thailand. That's the way out. That's the way out. Um, like like wealthy families don't put their kids in Thai boxing. Okay. Well, the wealthy families, you know, put them in Taekwondo or something. Thai boxing is a poor man's sport, and um, and that's why the most boxers come from Isan province. I'd say eighty percent of the Lumpini champs from Isan. Uh, Somrak is from Isan. Most most are from Isan province. Now the, they'll spread out. Isan is uh, northeast Thailand. Um, they'll spread out. They'll end up in Bangkok, this and this and that. But Isan is the poorest state in Thailand, okay. and that's why there's so many fighters. And um, it just becomes a tradition and family, and and like you know they find their way out. Bukau is from Isan. They're, they're all mostly Isan guys. All right. So the next one, I want all three of you to answer because you know these guys well. There's. Uh who wins in a fight? Let's make it a pro fight for money, since we're talking about pro money fights. Bubba Picard or Nick Cambasis? <laughs> if they're fighting together. And which one? For, they, I think they like wrestling together anyway, those two. <laughs> but, uh, they live together, don't they? Hey, who wins that fight? You know, who wins that fight? First of all, jo- Jovan, who wins that fight? Who wins that fight? I love them both. As I always say, I got one good son, one bad son. One <laughs> Bubba, one's Nico. But uh, who wins that fight? The pro, proper pro fight for money? Yeah. yeah Bubba. Bubba? Bubba? Interesting. All right. Wait, all right. Which, what, what, what rules? I'm a, I'm I'm, I'm assuming rules? that this Thai this this is in Thailand for money. Okay, in Thailand with, or boxing with, or MMA? A Muay Thai fight? It's a Muay Thai fight. Oh, I don't That's know. A Muay Thai or MMA? Oh, either Muay Thai than MMA, but because I don't yeah, know. No, a fight to death. Two out of three, you gotta kill the guy twice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I've only ever lost seven death matches. All right, all right, here. Okay, yeah, here so I'll... first, okay, two. Let's do it two ways. Who wins if it's a pure Muay Thai fight in Thailand for money? And who wins if that fight takes place in the UFC? The fans. Uh, yes, definitely. The fa- you, well, in both places, the promoter is going to win because the promoter makes the most money out of everybody. Yeah. Uh, but, but I give it to Bubba uh, based on power and durability. All, All right. Right. Nick's pissed now. Well, I, right, crew Barry, I, trained, I trained both of them, so... The master always keeps something for himself. I haven't shown them everything, so I'll beat both of them up. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Crew Brendan, let's say one takes place in Thailand, the other one takes place in the <sighs> UFC. Who do you give the fights to? <laughs> <laughs> They're both the hardest workers in the gym, 
it would be a bloodbath. Yes. And here it, they wouldn't fight each other. I mean, I can't answer that one. You next, well, you know, next question. Hold on, Nick Diaz. Bubba, I plead the yeah. fifth. Bubba's, yeah. Bubba's my coach, so I got to go with Bubba, but Bubba. I'll tell you what, man. I really love Nick's classes and the way he kicks where he's standing like straight up. He's got that karate and the movement. Actually, yeah. the most uh, exciting fight from the last uh, um, in-house that we had was when Nick did the demonstration with Caveman. And that was some exciting. No, the, Nick, mo- the foot movement, the head movement, because Nico can keep up with the best of them. I've yeah. only sparred him a couple times, but every time I look up, he's in a different place. Yeah, they're brothers, so that's a tough yeah. one. It's like, you know, well, if someone were to ask me if, who would win if I fought my brothers, I would win. But they are brothers, and Nick, Nick can mix it up really well. And uh, <laughs> next question. Hey, right on. Uh, All right. All right. right. Day, well, this actually, one's... this brings on to a good point. I just want to throw in here. In Thailand, okay? Okay. No, do, first of all, that, that question is moot. All right? The, 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 you put me as well. I love more bull gut skills, but mad money and taking odds. That, that's how it works. But um, in Thailand, no two guys from the same gym. Ever, ever, ever will fight each other. Doesn't matter how much money you put on the table. Oh, really? Yep, Is that like absolutely. an etiquette thing or it's that, a that's, rule? Or? It's just like um, etiquette, but it goes way back. Like, like no two guys from Cal Summer Bank will ever square off against okay. each other. Doesn't matter how much they put on the table. One will have to leave the gym. No, we're, all, we're all on the same team. We're a family. Of course. Uh, we've all got each other's backs. And that's what I love about Cal Summer and that, uh, you know, everybody here works together. We sharpen each other. We work together. And like, you know, we got a couple of new additions coming to the gym as well that we haven't announced yet, but people will see very soon. But uh, you know, everybody works together, and I believe we got some of the top kids, teens, adults, all working Absolutely. together. And like, um, you know, hopefully the next podcast after Nick and Hashmat's fight, we'll have some big announcements for you know us going to even another level. But we all work together. We're not out to compete against each other. Of course, and I think that's what everybody needs to understand. Like, we're all on the same team. You know what I mean? Hundred percent. Love those boys. I would hate to see that. Um, but uh, love them both to death. I would too because they both would give each other their best because they're both martial artists. And we've all so we've you, all fought like me damage. and uh, me and Crew B started as, as training partners. I mean, we had wars for, for you know years. It's like we fought a thousand times in the gym behind closed doors, and and it was a winner loser. No, it's just we're training, beating the crap at each other, and showing up tomorrow doing it again. All right, so now yeah. I gotta ask because Barry just brought this up. Okay, and this is another one of the questions that's being asked by one of our gym members. So this is only for Joe Van. If Crew B and Crew Barry were to go at it, <laughs> let's say, uh, oh, okay, man. let's say, one. let's century. say a Thailand. Who's let's driving you home? Thailand for money. Who who you got your money on? Two different styles. Two different mm-hmm. styles. We got we got the Tyson slugging style, and you got the IQ style. Two very different styles, and um, either or. I don't know. It depends. I could say this. I could say this. Depends I don't want to be leg kicked by Crew B or teeped by him, and I don't want to even come close to getting a left hook from Crew Barry. <laughs> Barry touches my chin. Yeah, Barry does have some power. Just, I, I've I, seen Barry. I've seen you hit the bag, and the heavy bag folds around your hand. I haven't dude, figured out how that. Yeah, works. I, I don't know if stop. I could keep it up for five rounds now. I, I, I've gained uh, about thirty pounds this year on the pregnancy diet. I went. I, I'm usually in shape. <laughs> I don't do anything. Yeah, that's what people don't believe me. Is I, I haven't. I haven't. He I don't drink alcohol. I don't. I don't smoke. I don't do it. And then. Uh, but this year I ate a lot of Wendy's uh, spicy chicken sandwiches, and I went up to about almost 190 pounds. I know it's the power, but there's no way I could keep that pace set. I got I got a good round in me, and after that I'm like, all right, this is this isn't fun anymore. But I, I mean, my my my, my in shape weight, I'm, I'm, I got to be about 165 pounds walking to be in shape, but. Uh, I mean, me and B have thrown down tons of times in in the gym, and I mean, uh, there, there's been days where one of us has gotten the better than the other. There's been days when it's even. There's been days where we both go home limping or going it's, home with black eyes back and forth. But it's just one of those things, you know. This goes back to the whole pro amateur thing. There's no hard feelings, man. It's strictly business. I fought friends of mine in Thailand lots of times. This is actually uh, how the Rebel Alliance first began. It came up on my news feed. Yesterday, it was like seven years ago. I was supposed to fight Joe Elliott. Me and Joe Elliott, he, he was the owner of Big Country. I'm the owner of Costume. We were supposed to fight in Oshawa, main event. 
And uh, I don't remember why the fight didn't end up happening, but it didn't end up happening. And then after that, we're like, you know what? Maybe we should just train together. We started training together for like, you know, a couple of years. And the next thing you know, Brockman's and then Whippy Moita. We all started working together. We're like, hey, we're actually better together if we all train with each other, support each other. And then, you know, we battle everybody from the West and from, you know, from the States. So that's pretty much how the Rebel Alliance started, really. Well, yeah, oh, no, no, no. Kind of like all the guys in the area that wanted to fight had met each other. And we, we pretty much fought each other behind closed doors in the gyms. And then we ended up just kept training. And now this is kind of what it's developed into is that, uh, all our gyms working together. And like me and, and Brockman and Antonio and Bill, like we kind of grew up together as martial artists in the same type of gyms. And we we're always brought back through essentially it was MMA and Jiu Jitsu that kind of connected us back together and we'd all learned our own skill sets and then we met up with, 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 with B. I've been with B now about every day for the last seven years just about that you know what I mean every single day we've been in this gym and, and we were at the part where uh, when we first started training together we had a pact of like you know what we're going to blow up this gym and we're going to both hit the pro scene and we're going to get to UFC but then it came to the point where it was like build the gym or build our, our, our own fight careers. But it was like, where do you really go? And, and you know, Brad was gonna have an eight fight deal for us and over two years and then to get us to this and that. But then it was like, you put that time into the fight or the gym. I mean, really look at where the gyms are now because of what we did. So it was either that, could have had a couple cool highlight reels or maybe had my skull caved in. I think we did the right thing. And, then they, well, and now we got kids coming up and we kind of put that time into everybody and we've, we've developed I'm world champions. This. and. I'm yeah. taking this chance of throwing and putting Kubi on the spot. I saw, I recently saw his higher highlight reel. He keeps on the down low. Outstanding, <laughs> outstanding, yeah. unbelievable, man. I knew he was a good striker. I didn't know he's that good in the MMA. Like, wow. Awesome, awesome. So, um, I'll tell you this watching his last fight on Facebook Live, it was terrifying. <laughs> it was absolutely terrifying how, finisher, what he did to natural that kid. Finisher, <laughs> ability. Wow, man. The last fight was honestly, it was just for me to be able to talk to my students now when they come to me or if I have a chat with them to be like, I did what I'm telling you to do. I dedicated myself 100% to fighting, no distractions. I hired myself coaches. I made the investments and I sacrificed my, I sacrificed work. I left my gym, dude. I left my own gym <clears throat> for like a month and a half. Like, leave a business. Like, I, I made those sacrifices. I put in the time. So that was at like, man, I'm in the, I'm in my late 30s, and I'm, I'm talking to the kids now. So when they come to me, I'm like, I'm just doing this because I, I, I'm, I did what I'm telling you to do. That's all that, that was about. But I appreciate uh, that. And maybe, maybe that's why I'm so comfortable here, being, being you know, with, with fellow veterans. Because nothing I hate more. Than the Kool Aid drinkers, you know the Muay Thai. The, the me, sad, like the no, you no, hate me, no, Joe no, man. Hell, Thanks, man. buddy. Hell, you don't have a ninja that. suit. You don't have a ninja suit. <laughs> a ninja suit. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah, the Kool Aid drinkers. <laughs> a lot of guys. A lot of a lot of people. And again, I'm not about name. I don't need to bad mouth nobody because. You know, reality speaks for itself. I've been there, done that, got the pictures, got the newspapers, got the magazines to prove it. Now it's the kids' turn. I'm not living yesterday. You know, it, it is what it is. So all these guys, you know, and uh, promoting, you know, bowing 10 zillion times, drinking the Kool-Aid, you know, want to be the, the, the golden technique from Thailand. It's all rubbish, man. Um, you know what I mean? Like... Reality, living in reality. When I'm talking with Kubi and Kubi, it's almost like I don't, you don't even got to tell me what to do. I know what to do. He knows what to do. It all just meshes together nice. That's why I'm so comfortable here, you know. And I can't wait to come back next year. Like, it's a, it's a real gym, a real place. You Going back to your first question, what would I tell kids who want to be a pro is sign your ass up at Cal Summer Gym. You won't go wrong, you know. I worked in gyms all over the world, man. I worked in Australia. I've been in Australia 15 times. I've been in Europe, all over Asia, Canada, USA. Like, like this, it don't get no better than this outside of Thailand. So, you want to, want to learn Thai boxing? Come here, you know. And uh, that's that. All right, I got a few more questions before we gotta let Fire you go. Away. But I gotta, I gotta ask them. So, first of all, pound, and this is pound for pound. Who is the heaviest hitter at our gym? 
And just let's let's limit it to the fight team because us grown ups that you know just kind of hit pads, it's whatever. But we call pads for everybody. Who is it? Who, who do you figure? Who do you figure is hitting pound the for heart? pound? Pound for pound, heaviest hitter at our gym. That'll be pound for pound. It'll be Bob Bob Picard or Riley Ford. One of the yeah, pound all right. For pound. I would agree with that. Riley once hit me with a teep I didn't even see coming and left me winded. Well, he's for getting about stronger two days. and stronger every yeah, week, and I'm getting hey, fatter and slower. You can't, really, <laughs> you can't really compare that because Riley's still a kid. Bob, Bob, yep. was, Bob was over 18, but uh, it'll be Riley or Bubba, one, one of the two. All right, so who do you think is the next superstar coming up from our kids' program? Next I'm gonna. Season. I might say. I might say. Logan Gamsby looks pretty damn good at that. What do you think? And that's my. That's my layman's opinion. By the way, I'm. I'm not a fighter. <laughs> I was gonna say the. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, that's what. That's what I do. I pick, and it's all about money. I pick. If I was in town, I'd pay Logan to be the next big thing if he keeps to it. He's still a youngster, though. And and because really young. I know Logan listens. Uh, let's do something positive for Logan right here. What's a what's a positive thing? Like, what does Logan do really well? What does Logan do well? He listens, he puts the work in, and that's it. See, there you go. If any other kids are listening to this that want to be like Logan, that's just it, man. And I, I don't think it matters what sport we're talking about. There's no secret. Like when I played time football, in, yeah. the way I got better at football and made it all the way to professional was listening to my coaches. Yeah. And, put, and then, like you said, be dedicated, put in the time, right? And I think no matter what you want to do in life, I don't care if you want to play piano. If you want to play piano, good. Listen to your teacher and dedicate yourself, right? It's the same kind of idea. Well, again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like, you're <laughs> there, they're your teacher because you believe in them. So why would you stop listening? You just listen to your teacher. That's it. That's, that's all you got to do. Um, so now, who, out of our little, little kids, who do you think's got the most potential out of the little, guy, the little guys and girls? And we're talking, like, what would you say, crew be like, eight and under? I ten and under? Yeah, ten and under. Ten and, uh, ten and under at our gym. Who do you think's got that potential right now? Uh, you know, he's uh, the gingerbread man. Right? Yeah. <laughs> he's, uh, he's got potential, but, 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 he, but he's... Uh, Mischievous kid. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I told I, I think I told Mandy and Alan and his parents, I was like, Man, you guys you guys deserve a purple heart. That kid's got he's he fights all this Muay Thai and he's still got energy to burn. Kills me. He, he's like one of those wind up dolls. Just wind him <laughs> off and let him go. All right, and now last question for you. Who is the most successful fighter you've trained? And uh, maybe give us a little backstory on how you trained him and how, how that fighter turned out. Well, that goes back. I uh, we was saying the, um, we were talking earlier about poor poverty and high kids. Had a ooh, he dropped off at the gym, so I'm going to gym, Chiang Rai. And like when I see gym, people have the misconception. Don't, don't like the kids have it easy here. You know what easy is? Easy, oh, yeah. man. They got nice gloves. They got, you know, and Kubi Generous, he's donated. I got a bunch of kids. They, Thai kids are poor, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they got no no gloves, no proper kit, no proper gear. And he donated you know, 10 odd pairs of gloves and hand wraps. And we were talking with Kubrick about this. I'll bring it back to him while I let him use it. Like, uh, Lonnie was over. I'm talking to Jim. The dude, a ring, a roof, a leaky roof, and a, and a field around. There's no toilet. There's no, there's no fans. You know, you maybe got one light bulb at night. Like, go come up in a hard, hard place because they don't have nothing else. So, that kid who was dropped off there, poor, he climbed the ladder and he made it to the top ten or so. That's fantastic. Well, Jovan, I have to say, uh, it's been an honest to God pleasure to be able to even, as a radio personality, I've interviewed a lot of people in my day, and you are a very interesting interview. Uh, and also, as a, as a member at this gym, I love that you come here in the summer and I hope to see you next year because I hope you understand that not just at Crew B's house, but you're more than welcome here. We absolutely love you. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was the Cal Samrit podcast. As always, I'm Matty Buller, your host with me, Crew Brendan Kalajundic, Crew Barry McDonald, and of course the great Jovan, the Stinger, Stoyanovsky. One, two, Big Lou. He knows what to do. 
Oh, oh, oh. All right, awesome. Thank you all, man.